The question at the origin of this study is apparently simple. Do representations of violence, say in a movie or these days a video game, generate an effect of purification or purgation of that, the violence that uh, we have in us? Or do representations of violence contribute to generating more violence? This apparently simple question uh, turned out to be more complex than uh, planned uh, and required two books in order to be properly addressed. Today I find myself in uh, Paris in order to launch the first volume of these twofold studies uh, on violence and the unconscious. And the first volume is subtitled The Catharsis Hypothesis. One of the reasons that uh, these questions of the effects of media violence is a complicated one is because the concept that is usually convoked in order to explain uh, the supposed purgation or purification that you might feel as we watch a violent representation in film or uh, we play video games is an ancient concept uh, that uh, is very difficult to translate and uh, goes by the term catharsis. Catharsis is very often translated as uh, purification, purgation, and in the 19th century, late 19th century and 20th century, the idea that there is a medical component to this ancient notion of catharsis became dominant, primarily through psychoanalysis, and is basically still informing or disinforming the popular imagination. So the goal of volume one is to tell the story of this catharsis hypothesis, starting with its origins in Aristotle's poetics, uh, a passing mention of catharsis, and then seeing how this concept has been picked up uh, in the Renaissance, uh, in the 19th century, via psychoanalysis, and more recently via mimetic theory, or as we call it, mimetic studies. Uh, I am the moderator. I'm not going to spend much time moderating. Yes, except to say, like the Beatles said when they arrived in New York, let the festivities begin. So, New Dish will start, and uh, you'll come next, and I'm next. Great. Uh, thanks very much uh, for being here. It's a busy schedule, and thanks very much to the organizers of the Coven era uh, for making space uh, of a book launch in a such a packed event. I'm very happy to, to be here. So, to present uh, this um, last book, uh, Violence and the Edible Unconscious, Volume 1, The Catharsis Hypothesis, and I'm so happy to do it in the company of uh, Marina Garcia Granero uh, from the University of Valencia and Bill Johnson, who doesn't need any introductions here. Uh, I wish to say that uh, this book. Uh, uh, is part of a series of books that uh, I've been publishing with Michigan State Universities, and uh, it's part of an ERC project I've led at KU Leuven uh, for the past five, six years. And uh, I wouldn't be standing here were it not for Bill Johnson's long-standing support uh, over the years. Uh. So what I wanted to, to do to get us started is simply situate the book within the context of what we started calling numeric uh, studies um, uh, in the context of, uh, of this grant. And so I'll, I'll, I'll say some general things before delving into the specificity of the book. Um, if you want to know more about the project, we have a website titled homomimeticus.au and Violence and the Edible Unconscious is the latest installment and the latest output of that project. But that project started long ago and it started when figures who knew something about my missus on the political front and how to use mimicry, for instance, to stimulate crowds appeared in 2016 and was in the US at Johns Hopkins. And I was uh, worried about that phenomenon. And they called it new fascism, uh, with a new in bracket, uh, uh, because they w I wanted to call attention to the danger of it. And we've seen that danger on January 6th, uh, the danger to democracy that it can pose when new fascist readers, that term is no longer controversial now, uh, take uh, control of the largest democracy uh, in the world. Another manifestation of mimesis that was internal to the project was, well, viral mimesis. So viruses are mimetic in the sense that they reproduce very quickly, but then they also reveal, uh, during a lockdown, for instance, uh, how violence can emerge within the domestic sphere. 
very often against women. We saw quite a, 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 an alarming manifestation of violence during the lockdown. We also saw positive manifestations of uh, Manisi's uh, models uh, that uh, stand up and serve uh, as examples uh, to follow. And, uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that uh, spread across the world, also by a form of Manisi, to call attention to, to the danger of racism and police uh, violence against, against minorities. Uh, and I'm giving you this because, because it's part of the context in which this book emerges. A number of crises in which my Mises seemed to play an important role. The so-called crisis of truth, what is true and what is false. We've seen a number of conspiracies going viral and contagiously. And, and now we have ChatGPT. So uh, there is a lot of work for uh, scholars in uh, uh, mimetic theory, and uh, we call that uh, mimetic studies to emphasize both continuities and discontinuities with mimetic theory. And I thought, well, you know, since this violence in the Oedipal unconscious is an intervention in mimetic studies, I thought I'd ask ChatGPT, what is mimetic studies? Uh, and the answer is, by the way, I did it in French and I did it in English, and you get different answers depending on the language. Uh, in, in English you have this. Mimetic studies is a term that refers to the field of research and scholarship that focuses on the study of imitation, mimicry and mimesis in various contexts. It explores the ways in which humans and other organisms imitate or mimic others, objects, behaviors, or ideas. I'd say, well, it's, it's a pretty good definition of what uh, uh, mimetic studies, as we understand it, actually is. Um, in French, it said, well, mimetic studies originates in Plato and Aristotle with the idea of limitation de la nature. Hmm? Uh, question of mimetic representation, we'd say, well, that's not exactly what we mean with mimetic studies. It's not a question of focusing, yet again, on how uh, art imitates or represents the world in a realistic fashion. Uh, that's not the main focus. Um, but this, I think, is a, is a good definition. And the books that uh, develop mimetic studies, I wasn't using the term yet, but the new fascist book that I alluded to before is one. And the book that develops the idea of mimetic studies is this one, titled Homo Mimeticus, A New Theory of Imitation, which has a chapter on Girard, and Girard I consider a major precursor of mimetic studies, I'll say why in a moment, uh, but also on Derrida, uh, but also on Nietzsche, but also on Anna Arendt, uh, but also on Byron Mises, but also on Jose Caillois, a number of figures who uh, thought about Mimesis. So the goal of mimetic studies is to broaden the scope of the study of Mimesis so that we have all the tools at hand to trace the different manifestations of what we call dominomimetics. And violence is one of them, it's a, it's a major one. So violence in the Oedipal unconscious uh, is the first volume of a diptych, uh, which uh, will be followed up by a second volume titled Violence in the Mimetic unconscious, uh, subtitled uh, The uh, Affective Hypothesis. The reason that ChatGPT doesn't know about it is because ChatGPT is not up to date. Two years behind, so cannot know about this definition. Uh, so what I want to do uh, is to contextualize a little bit more specifically uh, why I got started thinking about violence uh, and its relationship to the unconscious. And, uh, if we take a genealogical approach, there is an institution that was important when I started to work on this project. It's Johns Hopkins University. I was at Hopkins in, from 2013 to 2016 at the Humanities Center. And the Humanities Center played an important role for figures like Matarelli Girard, uh, but also Jacques Derrida, uh, but also J. Hillis Miller. Uh, Richard Maxi, who at the time with René Girard organized an important conference in 1966 whose goal was to introduce structuralism in the United States, was still alive when I was at Hopkins. So we had a number of conversations, you remember fondly René Girard uh, coming over uh, at his legendary library. And, and so this book uh, also tries to situate mimetic studies in the context of the structuralist controversy uh, that emerged in 1966. Actually, never introduced structuralism because uh, Derrida gave a paper uh, that was a critique of Levi Strauss that ended up launching post-structuralism, deconstruction. Uh, but that is uh, one context. Um, 
which is more kind of, let's say, philosophical or theoretical. The other context is that I was living in Baltimore, uh, in particular in, in Western Baltimore, in a very segregated city. Freddie Gray was murdered uh, during my stay. There were protests, and the problematic of police violence was in the foreground. And so it was not only theoretical, but it was also on a daily basis, uh, cycling through Baltimore and seeing the reality of violence against uh, African Americans. And more specifically, uh, my son was attending a, an, uh, an African American school uh, at the time, a preschool, and uh, a child in a parallel class was shot uh, that year. Uh, I was there, and uh, we tried to figure out. I brought my, my son to school and uh, they told us, well, the, the school is closed today, and uh, there's been uh, a death, uh, and it turns out to be a child. And so I asked, well, how is it possible? How could this happen? And it turned out that the, that the child had found a gun in his household, and that uh, his father was a policeman, and the gun was loaded. Uh, and so uh, that brought it home, you know, how pro close is this problematic of, of violence uh, and, uh, and the unconscious. Uh, and uh, the question that I asked was with respect to the overwhelming quantity of representations of violence that we see on media, starting with, well, of course, cinema um, and uh, more recently video games. I just started thinking, you know, how, how does a child, a four-year-old, get the idea to point the gun somehow at his body? And, uh, and so I thought, is there a link with video games? Um, because uh, the amount of time children spend uh, playing video games is, is, is rather uh, impressive. Um, I wanted to, to show you a trailer, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, that's another uh, starting point for, uh, for, the, for, for the books. It's a trailer with Bruce Willis uh, in a movie titled Vice. And uh, Vice is a resort, which is metaphorical of the internet, basically, in which all kind of crimes can be committed in relationship to so-called artificials. And artificial are women who are actually androids, robots. And, and you can commit all kinds of crime in the sphere of vice because they're robots, or they're only metaphorically simulations, representations. Uh, and uh, there is a policeman which acts, Bruce Willis plays the CEO of that company. And the policeman is investigating a, cr a crime that spilled from the world of vice to the real world, uh, killing a real woman. Uh, and he asked the question, you know, he says something like, you think that if one can commit any crime they want, they will get it out of their system. Uh, <coughs> But maybe, you know, the more they do it, uh, the more they get addicted to it, and they, don't, they won't get enough. And so that was kind of the moment in which I thought, okay, there are these two possibilities. Do representations of violence allow us to get it out of the system? Or does it generate addictions uh, in which we require always more violence uh, in order to be stimulated, and it might also spread contagion uh, from the sphere of representation? To react. And uh, so I started delving into the literature on new media violence, which is rather broad. This is a problem that has been around uh, for a long time. Uh, studies came out already uh, with the invention of television, and people were worried early on about it. And uh, there is not a clear consensus on it. But what I found interesting is that these studies that tend to be empirical studies uh, very often use concepts like catharsis. Or, or a contagion, and uh, since they are empirical, they're more interested in having questionnaires or you know studying empirically what happens when how many hours of violence do you watch, uh, and you know does that kind of allow us to say not that there is you know a direct causation but maybe a correlation uh, with real violence, and um, and I think that's very valuable. But it seemed that a philosophical reflection on the concept of catharsis and contagion was missing in this studies, a more qualitative, interpretative approach. And so I thought it would be useful to introduce a genealogy of this concept, a genealogy of catharsis and a geology of contagion. And I thought, well, I start with an article, and uh, I submitted an article to, to Bill's journal, uh, Contagion, uh, and the subtitle is The Cathartic Hypothesis, Aristotle, Freud, Girard. It seemed to me that if you want to start talking about catharsis, the minimum that we have to do is have a look at what uh, catharsis means in Aristotle's poetics, 
And then why, what was striking to me is that since few philologists, actually no philologists, competent philologists can tell confidently what exactly catharsis means in the poetics, how come such a technical concept has become common news in everyday parlance? You say you go to the movie, yeah, it was violent, but uh, it is cathartic. If I feel kind of, you know, uh, released of affects uh, and violence. You know, it's cathartic, it's a phrase that you use in everyday discourse. And it seemed to me the, the hypothesis that uh, psychoanalysis played a key role in rendering a rather obscure concept in Aristotle's corpus kind of linked to a medical interpretation of catharsis. It's going to make us feel better, therapeutic. And Girard, uh, as you uh, know, and we can explain here, uh, also uses the notion of catharsis uh, with respect to the scapegoating mechanism. Uh, and so it can be seen in kind of in, in this genealogical uh, uh, chain of thinkers. Uh, each thinker has his own theory of catharsis, so Freud is not the same as Girard, it's not the same as Aristotle, but it seemed interesting to connect and tell the story uh, of how this concept became somehow uh, popular. And then I thought I could compress everything in an article, but then for Contagion, I needed a second article, and I typed, subtitled it, The Contagious Hypothesis, Plato, Affect, and Mirror Neurons. Um, that's the origin of, uh, of this project on violence on young yeah, just these two articles that came out uh, in Contagion, uh, telling the story of catharsis and contagion, specifically in relationship to the re violence and its relationship to the unconscious. Uh, because I realized that uh, if empirical studies very often suppose an intentionality behind uh, violence, very often, like the case of uh, the poor kid who killed himself, there was obviously no intentionality there. There are kind of, it could be accidental, but it can also be a uh, reflex mechanism, involuntary situations of stress, of police aggression. Uh, that are not under the con control of consciousness and are in the sense unconscious. And it seemed to me that one unconscious uh, was in line with an animal uh, tradition that uh, finds uh, an important starting point in, in psychoanalysis, of course. And for the neural neurons, contagion, and affect, uh, I uh, developed this concept of the mimetic unconscious, an unconscious that is much more physiological that has to do with mirroring reflexes that uh, uh, can be triggered without our conscious awareness. That's the context for the books. Initially, Bill uh, kindly suggested that uh, I should uh, write uh, a short book for his breakthrough in mimetic theory. Uh, and so I started working on that when I was applying for the ERC grant, and I, and I was kind of expanding it and realized this is not going to fit, I'm afraid. You know? Catharsis especially uh, kept uh, uh, enlarging. If you want to do justice to each specific context, I felt that I needed more space. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to do one book on violence in the unconscious. And that was the title. And the obvious reference is uh, an allusion to violence in the sea. I wanted to have a focus on that since Girard didn't specifically address the problematic of the effects of media violence. Uh, so it could be a supplement in many studies. And so I think I'll, I'll stop here. The, it eventually turned out to be two books, as I mentioned, uh, and the first volume that uh, we are launching today is divided in uh, five chapters. The first longer chapter is on uh, uh, Girard. It started the true unconscious, Girard to Freud. And I'm interested in showing that despite the fact that very often Girard puts himself at a distance from Freud, there are a number of important continuities between Girard and Freud when one looks at it from the angle of catharsis. And uh, I didn't find much literature, there is a lot on, on Girard, of course, but specifically on catharsis, it seems to me that it's something that still requires development. And so I started with Girard because I thought he was the latest, strongest proponent of a theory of catharsis that is not linked to media violence, it's linked to an anthropological phenomenon, the scapegoating mechanism, but can be traced back to uh, Freud and the cathartic method, to the origins of psychoanalysis, starts with Freud and Breuer, who developed the so-called cathartic method in order to attempt to cure hysteria uh, in the 1880s, so it tells the story of the origins of psychoanalysis. And, and then I tried to figure out what catharsis means in the poetics, because Freud and Breuer took the idea of catharsis from Jacob Bernays, and I don't know how many of you have heard of his name, 
but is the one who is responsible for the definition of catharsis as a medical purgation of thought, which has become common parlance thanks to psychoanalysis. Jacob Bernays was uh, the maternal uncle-in-law of Sigmund Freud. So there is a direct connection. Bernays was a specialist of Aristotle. He read the poetics, but specifically the politics. And, uh, and so that I, I, I focus on the, on the poetics. And then with Nietzsche, I, I try to uh, propose uh, uh, a critique of the uh, catharsis hypothesis that uh, uh, introduces already the idea of contagion uh, and influence. And the book ends with a, with a critique uh, of hyperspecialization, because I, I think that one of the problems with the confusion in, in media violence and the effects uh, on uh, what uh, of representations of violence and bringing in catharsis is that there is not enough dialogue between disciplines. Aristotle is a philosopher, Bernays was a philologist, Freud is a psychoanalyst, Damien Girard is interdisciplinary, and it seems to me important to bridge differences, to bridge disciplines, in order to try to contextualize a concept that is used across different perspectives. Okay. What about Sylvia? That's one of the same questions for me. I first would like to start by thanking Nina Slotu for inviting me to join him along with Bill Johnson at this book launch. My time as an associate member of the Only Ethicals and Gender Minority Project at KU Leuven has been incredibly informative. And as a mentor, Nina is extraordinarily generous with his time, guidance, and feedback. And I am delighted that, that our collaboration still continues now that he has been appointed full professor at Leiden University, and I have returned to my home institution in Valencia. I truly appreciate his continuous support. The own project officially ended last year, but the team still going strong around the globe. I remember arriving in Leuven in January 2022 and asking Nidesh what topics he would like me to research within the medical studies or what roles I should play within the team. And he replied, as if the answer was obvious, almost a no question, by saying, you're a Nietzsche scholar. And I recall that instant as a joyous moment uh, of recognition, as, as being recognized by Nietzsche as a genuine and valid Nietzsche scholar. But my point here is that since then, and as part of the home team, my role has always been through exploring Nietzsche as a key genealogical figure in negative studies and his legacy for contemporary thinkers of my Nietzsche. That's also what I will focus on today in my contribution in this book launch. But that is not just my individual task, of course. It is one of the central collective goals of the theory of homomimeticus, which uh, Lotu has been exploring since his first book, Phantom of the Ego, from 2013, also published with MSUP. There, either Nietzsche played an important role. And since that book, uh, Nietzsche has philosophically foregrounded a, a Nietzschean foundation for mimesis in a genealogy that goes back to Plato through Nietzsche. And this also explains the use of, book, the, use of the word studies in mimetic studies to stretch the plurality of genealogical foundations, disciplines, and thinkers of mimesis. And now I will focus on the book that gathers us today, Violence and the Ethical of Unconscious, as, as it has already advanced, it's a two-volume book on the complex transdisciplinary problem of violence, and specifically around the controversy concerning the alleged cathartic and contagious effects of the representation of violence. And the diptych structure is, stages the agon and the mirroring continuities between those hypotheses, catharsis, and the affective contagious, contagious hypotheses. The first volume we launched today focuses on the catharsis hypothesis and allegedly purifying purgative process, while the second forthcoming deals with the mirroring alternative contagious or affective hypothesis. But in the first book, also I wanted to note that a lot to consider not just media violence, which seems to have become a scapegoat itself, but the relation between violence in its very plural manifestations and the mimetic unconscious. And in this point, let me please uh, amplify the scope for a moment 
the main premise of our understanding of mimesis is that imitation is the constitutive behavior of a thoroughly imitative species we call homo mimeticus. And the project and its outputs suggest a multiplicity of uh, principles and concepts, some of which are directly Nietzschean expressions, for example, the pathos of distance or the phantom of the ego, and others are Nietzschean style, but coined by uh, Nietzsche, for example, the mimetic pathos, the mimetic unconscious, and pathologies, patho dash in brackets, logis. Overall, and again, returning to the book, to the first violence book, uh, Nietzsche anticipated a broader account of violence that goes beyond the cathartic principle, and there lies uh, the interest. And this is what Nietzsche develops in the book's fourth chapter. He argues that Nietzsche was a pioneering explorer of the unconscious, especially unconscious powers. And I would like to note that I consider Nietzsche's Lotus a perfect model of, of what it means, what it means to incorporate Nietzsche as a perspective. Because Nietzsche did not want disciples who would uncritically repeat his doctrines or develop an antiquarian relation to his philosophy. And in my view, incorporating Nietzsche as a perspective means adopting, when suitable, of course, the concepts, ideas, and frameworks that Nietzsche passed on to us. For example, perspectivism, genealogy, nihilism. And in this case, we use Nietzsche to analyze contemporary issues, mimetic issues, the multiple manifestations of my nieces. And so returning to the book that we are discussing today, and again, exemplifying, exemplifying our relation with Nietzsche, I would like to stress the central Nietzsche-inspired concept in my remaining time, mimetic agonism. Mimetic agonism is a positive supplement to the violence of mimetic rivalry. And Nietzsche uh, not to co point this concept as a form of an intellectual and creative contest with predecessors, intellectual predecessors, that appear at first sight to be simply opponents or antagonists, antagonist, sorry, but on a closer genealogical investigation, they provide the conceptual and theoretical tools to establish the opposition in the first place. Thus, in a creative but also mimetic uh, way. Examples, for example, are Plato contra Homer, Aristotle contra Plato, Nietzsche contra Plato, Nietzsche contra Wagner. And Lotu also speaks of a romantic agon, a less noble variation of the same mimetic agonism. Examples could be, for example, Freud contra Nietzsche. And I especially appreciated this distinction between romantic and mimetic agonism. I think it's one of the main takeaways of the book. And to advance it briefly as an invitation to read the book itself, a mimetic agonistic confrontation is not the same as a violent rivalry. Many times, rivalry betrays an underlying mimetic anxiety and a longing to be original and authentic because people do not wish to be confused with others, especially when the similarities are, are striking, when the similarities prevail. And so romantic rivalries are based on a myth of originality that did not, uh, surprisingly, it did not have such a tight grip in the Greek and Roman age. And that is why mimetic agonism, inspired obviously in uh, the ancient Greece, is an alternative way to channel this confrontation in a new, creative, productive duration, but obviously still imitative. And so, not to coin this term, mimetic agonism, based on Nietzsche's agonistic text, like, for example, Homer's context. And Nietzsche's agon does not consist of violent and exclusive self-assertion against the other. Instead, it represents a collective cultural task. The mimetic agon is vital to turn away from catharsis, not to purge our aggressive impulses through the scapegoating 
of an, of an innocent victim, but to, 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 to channel our pathos, our forces, once again, here Nietzsche redirects us to the Greeks, because, and this also connects with uh, Nietzsche's understanding of the genius. The Greeks did not abandon the emergence of genius to mere gen, uh, chance. Genius was produced through careful training, and Nietzsche even used the untidy physiopsychological term of breeding, now very polemical, of course. But the point is that the Greeks' pre-Platonic education, as we all know, was based on imitating the behaviors and values of specific heroes, role models, legendary characters, and these the identifications were an essential part of this agonistic paideia. As a trained philologist, Nietzsche was perfectly aware of this and regretted its loss, the loss of the mimetic foundation that, pro that produced and concentrated the greatest number of philosophers with the utmost splendor. Great philosophy, of course. He says, several geniuses not just one, several. That's the, the point, that's the goal. And so Nietzsche engaged so much with Greek philosophers because their existence proved that a superior type is possible, that it can be desired as a social ideal, and even surpassed. And what is honorable is to imitate them, the Greeks or any other uh, example to work here, any other cultural, on the social project we might cherish. And the, the, what is honorable, what is desirable, is to have the right to consider ourselves as part of that same heroic chain. And this again speaks volumes against prevailing prejudices around Nietzsche as an individualistic thinker and a defender of violence. On the contrary, he longed for a community on his corpus with figures like the good Europeans and even the overhuman's advent. It, the overhuman also requires collective work. My point here is just that out of antagonism, not only comes rivalry, and this dissent should not necessarily create violence and exclusion. To turn mimetics rivalry pathology, sickness, into a patho dash logic, a critical of pathos of, of path, a critical of pathos. To turn that into mimetic agonism, that is the goal, surely both. And so, at the end of this career, and to conclude, and Girard, for example, in Baden to the end, he acknowledged that violence had not only lost its cathartic power, it may contribute to creating more violence instead. And so, and with this I mean that Girard diagnosed the return of violence deprived of its cathartic efficacy. Because after all, the catharsis hypothesis remains a riddle, and it might just be a theoretical illusion. What remains, and Lotu argues in this book, is the return to the Asian hypothesis of contagion, contagion, and the reality of this mimetic pathology that obviously continues to require require major work, clinical, transdisciplinary, and immanent investigations to be adequately assessed. And the book obviously genealogic, genealogically rests on a long-standing tradition of theorists of manesis and the unconscious, later Aristotle, Nietzsche, Garnet, Freud, Girard, Edgar Morin, Van Harden, Adriana Cavallero, among others. And so to conclude, violence at the Oedipal unconscious contributes to a theory of homometricos for future generations to come, building on the legacies that we have received and aiming to genealogical pass, uh, passing on the torch of knowledge, to form a community based on the mimetic agon in this sense of the good areas, a productive affirmation. And the general attitude, attitude of the book is not the transition of a single doctrine, but to open up a conversation as we hope to do today in this round table. Thank you. So Girard asked for a hometicism, and he said, it's got to be done and we translate it this way, in big chunks, right? Us. Um, but Girard didn't like to be chunked himself, so that's the truth. Um, 
In fact, I enjoy Gerard's playful contrarian habit. The Latour depicts Gerard as anxiously fleeing the mantle of the Hegelian tradition. I resist almost by instinct. When I looked at the passage in Battling to the End, which Latour uses, I saw Gerard explain how he resisted being taped as a neo hegelian and I think he recounted as well how first he resisted the first position, then found a position from which to defend his resistance. But the position he defends, which is different from Hegel, is acute and consistent. Not desiring to be the other's desire, but desiring what the other possesses. The key relation Latou sets to Freud to the unconscious and to Oedipus for Girard is important and valuable. It needs emphasizing, as he's doing, but also renegotiating with a more careful um, summarizing of Girard. Here is Latou quoting Girard. So this is from Girard. The more frenzied the momentic hypothesis becomes, caught up in the confusion of constantly changing forms. The more unwilling men are to recognize that they have made an obstacle of the model and a model of the obstacle. Here we encounter a true unconscious and one that can obviously assume many forms. I think perhaps one who makes too much of Gerard's very reluctant and sparing use of the word unconscious here to suggest a hidden death of Freud. I find Gerard's relation to Freud open and above board. To put Gerard's version of the true unconscious very simply, it is not at all Freud's version which declares that the young boy cannot discover without help the truth that he wishes to kill his father and marry his mother to say all this very crudely. Rather, the unconscious or the non-conscious, the méconnaissance for Gerard, is not acknowledging a very different kind of truth. The victims, in their many forms, the Jews, the witches, the young son, are not guilty, and their persecutors don't know what they are doing. In other words, and this is one of my two main points, the purgation, the catharsis of sacrifice, is for Gerard a placebo, which works only as long as you believe in the unjust and refutable accusation. This is a uniquely a critical relation to the cathartic tradition. Uh, now I'll skip the Oedipus part. Now violence according to Gerard's hypothesis. Forensic, forensic archaeologists look at forearm bone damage for the earliest signs of intraspecies violence. Forearm carrying a blow from the antagonist's opposite arm as in a mirror. But imitation is not the right word here for blows matching rather than simply imitating counter blows. Violence can end with one vanquishing the other, or the other simply giving up, as in Wilfred Owen's fine great work on Strange Meeting, which echoes Clausewitz's reduction of modern warfare down to the Clausewitzian spiraling the two antagonists wrestling. The defeated German in, in Owen's uh, poem, the defeated German soldier, answers his English antagonist from the day before in the manner of killed him. But both now being in hell, and the German soldier says, I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. So sometimes, sometimes it would end violence, and then just human beings just sick of violence and can't do it anymore. But violence will hardly end there, not usually. More likely, others in any group they belong to cannot stay away from these two antagonists, lest it turn on them, as violence always spreads, it seems, like wildfire. Each tries to stop the violence from spreading with a violence of their own because they hate and fear it. Girard excavates what he called the non-deterministic mechanism of all against the last one, or all except the last one, from the in inevitable melee, which could not have first begun knowingly seeking a single guilty one, as if everyone already knew the secret of sacrifice. That comes later if it comes to life. It is much more likely that spontaneous violence wipes out a community and wipes it out again if it revives. Only the spontaneous effect of a survival-sized group facing the last violent one could offer an algorithm, a right, to be repeated next time violence breaks out, an attempt to repeat what happened last time when peace came for almost everyone except one last. The best score 
most likely to leave some historical record is all against one. This is sacrifice empowered by méconnaissance, human, humans misunderstanding their own violence by expelling it, displacing it on another, making it sacred. Girard shows us that sacrifice is a placebo against breakaway violence that works only as long as humans believe in it. Kick the dog, he said. Kick the dog, the motive underneath, uh, underneath sacrifice is as simple as that, the displacement. Unloading your resentment and fear against a safe victim is the procedure of sacrifice. Releasing oneself, releasing oneself from the weight of unjust restraint from, a, uh, from uh, the, the, the person you don't dare care. What do we do about violence now after sacrifice? The modern resort to the judicial system for the last word of violence is uh, the best game we have for that, probably the last. I felt that Nidish was too hard on the American police, but he lived in Baltimore. I didn't. I didn't respect his opinion for being both inside and outside American violence. Last winter, a man attacked our campus at MSU, shooting several students, killing three. His life was a mess, so he kicked him off, then killed himself, as many do, to have the last word of violence. We understand better, thanks to Gerard, the continuities and discontinuities in violence between the sacrificial and the judicial system. We must improve the American judicial system. We cannot afford to abandon it. But finally, all praise to Nadesh for writing this book and its companion, which appears in September, and also for writing the grants, which also really impresses me, uh, that made the book accessible to you. It's very fun. Okay, thank you. Now we've got time for questions. Before, let me thank both Bill and uh, Marina for, for summing up key elements of the book that maybe attempts to do too much for a book that presents itself on, you know, entering the riddle of the effects of media violence. As I said, you know, I needed more and more and more space and opening up new and new concepts, new medical being one of them. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. To your question, in intersubjectivity and pathology, yes, that's one of the continuities between mimetic theory and mimetic studies. The assumption that homo mimeticus is mimetic is because it is relational, inherently relational. So there is an ontological relationality that is internal to homo mimeticus, and I see it very close to the Girardian model. The main difference would be that uh, my focus is not on mimetic desire as such, but on what I call mimetic pathos, uh, using this idea that all affects are relational. Sympathy is a very relational affect that you mentioned. Empathy is relational as well. Uh, and so the question is how to turn the pathology that uh, homo mimeticus is open to, we are all open to a kind of pathological negative affect, uh, into what I call a pato slash dash logi, uh, into a logos on this mimetic pathos that allows to take distance, critical distance. And I'm afraid there are no formulas for that, but creating spaces for conversations, uh, education, uh, conferences, are spaces where, the way I see it, uh, we develop pathologies. We reflect on the pathology of violence, on the pathology of escalation of war. We develop a logos. And genealogy is the strategy that I emphasized in this book. Let's look back to predecessors. Girard, but also Freud, but also Plato, but also Aristotle, Nietzsche, uh, and get all the logo that we can in order to account for this dynamic, which is constantly changing. It's constantly changing, and constantly require new concepts. Which leads me to the second question, mimetic agon. Why did I feel the need to introduce an additional concept of mimetic agon? Because I think it is useful to think of creators, intellectual creators, philosophers, Girard, uh, uh, theory, in a dialogic conversations with influential predecessors. That it's not a relation of rivalry. It doesn't lead to violence, it leads to books it leads to books like Violence and the Sacred, which is based on a fundamental mimetic agon, for instance, with Freud. The great chapter on Freud that uh, Bill zoomed in, and maybe I'm doing too much on Girard's notion of use of the unconscious there. But I can tell you, uh, my advisor is a specialist of Freud, arguing one of the most uh, internationally renowned specialists of Freud, Michael Borch Jacobson. 
I read Freud carefully, Gerard read Freud incredibly carefully to write that chapter on the Oedipus complex in the second chapter afterwards. It's a great reader of Freud, it's a critical reader of Freud, but he, he understands Freud so well, uh, and that's why he's so critical, because he's so close to it. So mimetic agony is a way to account for how concepts and types emerge in confrontation with predecessors that seem to be simply opposed. Of course, the opposition between Freud and Gerard is obvious, because Gerard always stresses that opposition, as he always stresses this opposition to Plato. Or to Nietzsche, it's rather obvious, but he reads them very, very carefully. And in order to see that proximity, you need to be a theorist yourself. You need to develop your own theory. Because then you see the strategy behind. Why does he say it? You see, he says it. But why does he emphasize difference here where it's so close? And that's a mimetic agon. Uh, it comes in as a way of writing with and against, uh, a double movement. We see the opposition. For the, for, the, for the continuity, we need more genealogical distance, and that's why I, I had to line up and stop. Yes. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew, very much. Yes, indeed, uh, the book can be said from that as a warning against the catharsis hypothesis by showing how the medical interpretation, and, uh, and you're right in pointing out that uh, for Girard, it is a placebo. But a placebo is still a medical thing. You say it's a placebo, and placebo do have effect. It's not just a placebo, because if you do believe in the placebo, uh, medical science shows what well, you feel better. Eh? So, but it's a medical interpretation of catharsis. And that's why there, there are moral interpretations of catharsis as a form of uh, moral purgation. There are aesthetic interpretations of catharsis. That's why it's important to bring up the, the agony in the theater, because that's where it all, it all starts in that way. So I would agree with that, with what you said, but emphasizing that the medical interpretation of catharsis that is internal to Girard remains in my reading, and then you'll have to see if the book convinces you, because genealogy needs to be attentive to details. Quotes the text and lines it up. Uh, see if the argument holds up, in your view, is still a Freudian uh, legacy from the cathartic method that Freud got from Jacob Bernays. It's not that Girard says that it's not like us. He also quote uh, the neoclassical French mm -hmm. tradition, Racine and so forth. Uh, but they had, a, they had um, a moral concern with catharsis, the neoclassical. So that's, a, that's the point on, on Freud. I think that, yes, uh, the differences are apparent, but catharsis is one of those strange, uh, little emphasized entry mm -hmm. that allows to see for continuities in my reading that I would group under rubric of mimetic agent. Very briefly on the agon in the theater, Yes, I fully agree. Uh, uh, that's the origin, right? The theatrical uh, is an agon, and there is an agon within the play. Uh, I was drawing on a tradition which is attentive to the fact that the, uh, the theater itself was agonistic in the sense that it was a competition, Sophocles would go up against the predecessors, and it would be uh, a kind of confrontation with more than one predecessor, several geniuses. As, uh, as uh, Marina said in, in uh, Nietzsche's view in Omer Contest. And in Omer Contest, which is a known text that Nietzsche scholars know about, but Nietzsche makes a distinction between the good Aries and the bad Aries. Mm -hmm. And the bad Aries is perfect numeric rivalry. I mean, it's exactly like Girard. Nietzsche and Girard fully agree uh, that competition can lead to envy and jealousy and something more, and violence. But then there is also this good Aries that I thought it's worth emphasizing and promoting.